So I'm Sarah Wynick and I'm going to be chairing this session. So welcome again, everybody. Um, we've got an hour and a half now for what I hope is going to be an exciting talk, mixture of speakers, Sebastian and Lopa, and also some breakout experiential part to it. Um, and this, as you know, is part of our Centenary Festival, um, which I hope some of you at least have been visiting on other occasions and will join us on future talks. Um, I think I'm going to introduce Sebastian and, and Lopa now and then there, I just want to say something about the frame. Um, so, and it's particularly relevant, I think, to the content of this talk, which is very much about experiential groups and about group dynamics and what goes on um, in groups. And the frame is a very important concept to us in thinking about organizations and groups. Um, and the frame for these meetings, these centenary speeches, speakers and, and sort of sessions, is something that we've been sort of working on and thinking about and trying to think what works best when you've got several hundred people online in this format, um, quite different to how it would be under different circumstances if we weren't in the middle of a pandemic. So um, what we're proposing in terms of um, how things will work is that whilst Sebastian and Lopa are speaking, uh, we've disabled the chat because we found that having two things to pay attention to is really distracting. And also that the speakers can't read the chat whilst they're speaking. And then it sort of looks as though they're not paying attention to what people are saying. And that can feel really uncomfortable um, and it's unavoidable. So the chat was, is going to stay off until we finish the speaker part of the, the session. But when we're having uh, you know, questions and dialogue, obviously the chat will go back on so that you can ask things or set, make comments in the chat, as well as being able to put up your hand with the raising hand symbol uh, and being able to speak with your voice. So there will be two, two ways of making yourselves heard, but that won't come till a bit later in the session. So we're gonna start now, I think, with the speakers. Um, Sebastian Kramer is someone who I have known a very long time, since about 1990. Uh, and we've worked together on and off all this time. Um, he came to the Tavistock in 1976 and he set up and ran the child psychiatry training there, as well as being a family therapist and child psychiatrist in the Tavistock. Um, and that's how I came across him. Um, and he then also set up and developed the paediatric mental health liaison service at the Whittington. And he also, I think, has had a huge effect on the development of paediatric liaison as a specialty, a subspecialty of psychiatry, and in thinking about what goes on between minds and bodies and doctors who look after bodies like paediatricians. Um, and he writes quite a lot about paediatric liaison, as well as also writing a lot about fathers um, and about a, a whole host of other things. He's a, a prolific writer and you may have come across things of his. Um, and he's very interested also in the history of the Tavistock and uh, is the co-editor of 2020 Vision, which is the book celebrating our centenary. Lopa is, uh, was a paediatrician to start with. Um, and then came into psychiatry and came into paediatric liaison. So that's the connection between her and Sebastian. Um, and more recently, she has trained as an executive coach and is working with groups um, and no longer in London, doing that in the West Country. Um, so I think without further ado, we will move on to Sebastian, who is going to open today's talk. Thank you, Sarah. Um, I don't have my slides, so Ghazal is going to show them. <clears throat> if you could show the first one, please. <clears throat> uh, 
The subtitle, which is not there, is this is for discussion, not instruction. Next slide, please. What I want to talk about are meetings, not just study groups or and certainly not about group therapy, which is not something I know about, but about the kind of meetings that you might have at work. And in my clinical experience, team meetings where you discuss cases. And I want to really get, get enthusiastic about how, if you take seriously every contribution in that group, you get more out of it. But actually, it means dealing with incompatible voices. No wonder people get distracted from the task in that situation. Next slide. <clears throat> I want to talk about these four people um, because they are crucial to the Tavistock. Two of them are non-clinicians and two of them actually never worked at the Tavistock. In fact, I think Kurt Levine actually never met any of them except for Eric Trist, but I'm not sure about that. These are all white males, but they were all outsiders, like the nonconformists who founded the Tavistock in 1920. And that is an aspect of the Tavistock which runs through its entire story of being not in the mainstream, but having, so, having something unusual to say. Next slide. Here's Kurt Levine. He was born in the 19th century. Uh, he was brought up in an Orthodox Jewish family and was aware that he would never be able to become a professor in Germany where he settled. He was influenced by Marxism in the German revolution, which took place at the same time as the Russian one became a Gestalt psychologist where the idea of the whole is other than the sum of the parts, hit him with great force. And you may not have read much or any of his work, and indeed it's very hard to read, but he actually created terms which we use easily without acknowledging its source, group dynamics, social field, action research, and field theory. In 1933, he left Germany uh, because he was Jewish and went to America. And he supported the creation of the Tavistock Institute after the war and its journal, Human Relations. And then he died quite prematurely in 1947. Next slide. These are some of the things that uh, Levine talked about, which are understandable. He was very keen on formulas and being scientific. Uh, but I'll quote, I like the quote, I can think only in groups and he would take his colleagues and research students to cafes and restaurants in Berlin before 1933, working there together. This is a development of the German invention of a seminar, which came from German universities at the beginning of the 19th century. He said of action research, you can't understand a system until you try to change it. He was involved in, when he got to America, training for leadership, especially involving minority ethnic groups, very dramatic, uh, experiences of running groups which had never been done before where people could speak their minds and reflective feedback which he acquired from the later development of cybernetics which in fact he had anticipated with his field theory. On the top of the screen there is a sugar molecule, glucose molecule. What he said was the molecule is nothing like the atoms of which it's composed and he said a group is like that. The group is nothing like the people that are in it. And he wanted to move from Aristotle, who saw things in themselves, to Galileo, who saw things in relationships. So he was rather original and brilliant. Next slide. This is my second pioneer. Learning from experience is a phrase that is associated with Wilfred Bion. He had a traumatic childhood being taken away from his happy, idyllic Indian home where his parents lived and sent to an English prep school where he'd never seen frost or snow before uh, in East Anglia. And then when he was 19, as in this picture, uh, was involved in the first tr tank battles of the, sec of the First World War and wished he had died then. His nonconformist education put him out of place when he went to Oxford. They all said, oh, here comes, here comes Bion with his nonconformist hat on. And he was really quite unhappy until he met his 
first training analyst, John Rickman, at the end of the 1930s. I thought Rickman liked me, he said. Next slide. And here is Rickman, less well known, uh, also died quite young. He was a Quaker and he went to Russia in the First World War while Bion was at the front line in Cambrai. Rickman was in Samara helping people with the typhus epidemic, but also observing the impact of the revolution on the peasant society. And he became an amateur anthropologist in effect. When he came back, he was advised by Rivers to go and have analysis with Freud, which he did, and later read Lewin uh, in the end of the thirties. Next slide. This is what Bion and Rickman did, uh, which was quite unique and quite special. It lasted for six weeks. There was a hospital near Birmingham where these two took over a psychiatric hospital for soldiers. And they said, we're not gonna treat individuals. We're going to treat the entire community. And they said, we have a meeting every day and you have to organize yourselves into groups to do things. Do your own occupational therapy. They didn't do anything for, a, for weeks, there was chaos, uh, but eventually they got the message and they organized themselves. And it was a remarkable thing, as uh, Bion said, uh, the, they, they managed to find their contact with reality and regulate their relationships with others. And they formed a dancing class, which I think is significant because that's the sort of thing you need to do if you're a man and you want to meet a woman. So they did. Next slide. This is the uh, bigger project of the wartime, which led to the Tavistock's understanding of how groups function. The army had run out of public school boys to supply with, with officers and had heard that in Germany, they were using psychologists to select officers for training. So they decided to do the same thing and after much exploration, landed on the idea of leaderless groups, which, is, um, which was consisted of about 30 people gathered together for a day, for three days, and told again to organize themselves. But they were given things to do, build, build a bridge over that stream. And while the army were very impressed with this because it seemed like it was testing their muscular capacities, the observers who were all the future Tavistock group, noticed that the some of the men were had better contact with the others and seemed to be able to be in meaningful contact with the group and these were the ones they selected for leadership and the outcome was dramatically better next slide here are just some of the people involved in it um, you will notice that there are no pictures of Bion at that time it's as if he was a kind of ghost i do not understand it I've never seen any pictures of Bion between the ages of 19 and in his 60s. There's a Lieutenant Colonel Eric Trist, whom I'll mention later, and Major John Rickman, two other names that you may know well, but we don't talk about them today. Next slide. Remember, this is the 1940s. Above there on the right is His Majesty's ration book. Everybody had one but also is a shilling piece from 1946, where it indicates that he is the emperor of India. The, the British empire was in full swing in, 19, in, the late, in the mid 1940s, and no one could have guessed that it would dismantle itself within the next 15 years. We had egalitarianism with ration cards, but the, the assumed entitlement of the upper middle class white male was total. This was not questioned. Of course, we still know that entitlement, but it is now being questioned, thank goodness. Everything was nationalized and it was hard to get food. But this was a revolutionary time in the Tavistock, Tavistock clinic mind. Next. Just briefly, there are three basic assumptions which people talk about, and I don't want to talk about the first two except to mention that they were also Freud's ideas of the church and the army. That when you're in a group, 
you don't have to think about it. You sort of feel, oh, this person's going to help me and I don't have to do anything, or this person's going to save me or deal with the enemy. But it's the third basic assumption, which I found really surprising when I first read about it. Next slide. And that is called pairing. And Beyond said he noticed that in a group, uh, a man and a woman would be talking and they somehow lost interest in everybody else. And the rest of the group would be fascinated by them and would acquire a sense of hopefulness about something that was going to happen in the future. A, a leader of the group should be unborn. Now I put this picture of Brad Pitt and Jennifer Aniston up. It's a year ago this month that they met and everybody got very excited about them because they're not together. But of course, everybody wants them to be together except presumably them. And the idea of it, the excitement of this is a sort of global pairing which I think reminds us that it's not just something for groups in the Tavistock, but actually for the whole world. And that's a, a messianic belief, which we're quite familiar with in the supporters of Donald Trump today. Next slide. Here is the fourth of the pioneers who said of himself, he was guilty of enthusiasm, but he also enthused other people in a remarkable way so that he never made them feel uh, less clever than him, even though he was quite brilliant. He was a grammar school boy. He had never expected to go to university, but he did, got a scholarship. But, you know, the, the public school boys there treated him as inferior and he didn't have any money. And he, he got triple firsts everywhere he went, but didn't feel that he belonged there. Another outsider. He went to, to um, America, but only after meeting um, Eric it's meeting Kurt Levine as a student in Cambridge. Levine wanted to see the statue of Newton in uh, Trinity College and Trist was entranced by this great man whom he'd already heard of and went to America, discovered Marxism and the depression and came back a changed man. After being involved in the War Office Selection Board, he set up the civil resettlement units which were therapeutic communities for prisoners of war who were very traumatized and also hadn't done much dancing. He helped to set up the, the Tavistock Institute and group, he directed the first group relations conference. Next slide. This is his most famous early work, which was a request from the coal board, newly nationalized to find out why some mines had good morale and some didn't, but he found with his colleague Ken Bamforth, that the mines where the morale was good had teams of men working in self-organized schemes. They weren't following rules by managers. They were doing what they knew how to, they knew they were cooperating with each other, something their fathers had done before them. Uh, the coal board did not like this report, nor did the mining unions and rejected it. But that was a discovery that inspired Trist enormously, self-managed groups. Next. Um, we have to remember besides basic assumptions that we are also uh, primates, uh, that we have millions of years of evolution. Here's a group of nine primates. It's a photograph I've had for 70 years and haven't really looked at until preparing for this talk. I am on the second on the left at the back row. And you can very quickly see who the alpha male in this group is. This Dunk, uh, um, Stuart Dunlop, the bottom left there, who's is the only boy whose name I remember. Um, and you can tell from my body language that I'm not quite sure of where I am, but I'm certainly not at the bottom of the heap, who I think was that unfortunate boy on the left, on the right in the back, whom I'm sure would have got teased quite a lot. But I reckon I was above the middle, so I didn't get too much stick from anybody. The point about this story is that we are primates. We do need to know where we stand, not only, of course, males, but females. And the basis of rivalry in groups is eternal. It's something we cannot escape from and controls our behavior in groups. Next slide. So to conclude on a few points of more later work in the Tavistock, so this is in the 1970s, Janet Mattinson at, at the Institute for Marital Studies noted that in supervision, 
uh, there was a reenactment between her and the supervisee of something to do with the case. This had been discovered by Harold Searles two decades earlier, and it is of course now well known. Uh, Mattinson was influenced by Jung who said, you can exert no influence if you're not susceptible to influence. But she wanted people not to feel ashamed of that. Next slide. Um, and Ronald Britton, in whose seminars I worked as a registrar, noticed that the same thing happens in teams, that actually when you're discussing a case, it's very easy for the team to then take on the parts in the play that's uh, being discussed, that high-handed interventions by senior colleagues echo the domination of the family by the intrusions of an opinionated grandparent. Next. Group relations uh, is a, an enormous topic and I just want to mention it here. Uh, Eric Trist directed the first Esther conference in 57. And it's interesting that although other um, women had led group relations events before 1995, Olya Kalili was the first woman to direct a Leicester conference, which is still the leading, which is the flagship of group relations in Britain. But I wanted to mention the things that get enacted there, uh, basically all the things that happen in society that we are constantly preoccupied with and which put us off thinking straight. And I put a list of things there, which we may discuss later. I'd be interested to hear from anyone who's been in a group relations event, what their experiences were. Next slide. So this is uh, to conclude an uncommon sense in a work discussion group. The, the important thing is that the non-dominant voices have to be heard. Otherwise you just have an alpha male led group. Um, I first noticed that in a study group years ago when there was a young woman who didn't say anything and on the third or fourth day I realized I have to attend to this and of course you would know theoretically that you would but it was the learning from experience that I had that made the group uh, come to life when I identified her silence. It's significant that she was a woman, that she was young and that she was foreign. These are the various ways in which people can distract from a group process and yet which we have to accept as part of the group. Quite recently in a discussion group, we were talking about a particularly evil uh, event in a psychiatry hospital. And uh, one of the doctors said, we really shouldn't be talking about this. And of course I could have taken this as an attack on the on the task of the group, but it really was important to work out that actually he was saying, this is just too disgusting to think about. And we have to think about that before we can think about it. I think there is another slide. I wanted to say uh, that these are not the slides that I've prepared for the in the last 24 hours. I wanted to thank two people, one of whom I know is watching today, who have been my mentors, one of them, and they're both uh, independent minded leaders. And one is David Armstrong, a social psychologist whose concept of ethical imagination has fully, totally inspired me. He's the author of Organization in the Mind 2005, and he's writing about ethical imagination in the Tavistock Institute book next year or this year. The other is Anton Obholzer, whose book uh, is called, um, I've forgotten the title, his new book is just out. Uh, maybe if you scroll down, uh, Gazal, we may find a picture of it. And he was the leader of the Tavistock and then the trust from the 80s until the turn of the century. And just slide down, uh, that one there, that one there, managing difference, managing difference, one below that. There's David and there's managing difference. I just wanted to give the title of Anton's book, Workplace Intelligence. And if you can then go one slide up from there, Gazal, I can see, we can see David's ideas of ethical imagination, the capacity to reimagine forms of human association. These are two very encouraging people, very different in their way of doing so. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sebastian. Um, we're going to go straight on to Lopa. Um, and then we'll come to the more experiential part of this meeting.
Jack. Does that look right? You need to put it onto full screen, Lopa, okay. or onto slideshow, in fact. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, Sebastian. So I have the uh, anxiety provoking task of bringing us to the here and now. Um, and the aim for, for this section is to, to consider us as a temporary learning group. Um, we're an organization and um, the primary task is to figure out what is this about? <laughs> Um, so, so I sort of feel um, quite daunted by speaking to my own sense of um, facilitating rather than leading this group in the hope that we remain a leaderless group. Um, some of the experiences I had in, in getting to preparing the slideshow uh, was complete paralysis. It's much easier to present facts. So what are, what, who are the group I'm, I'm speaking to? Can we be a group when we're 500 odd people who are nameless and faceless? What will be projected into me by the group? Who will the group see me as? Will it be seen as token? I'm clearly not a white male. Um, will, it, will I be seen as entitled and privileged for being from the home counties and British Indian? Um, will I be able to own my own authority as a leader and credibility as an expert, enough not to rely on the testimonials I wanted to put up to prove that I'm good and that people do hire me, um, or the theory to prove that I am intellectual and I deserve to be here. So those are the feelings I'm, I'm holding and, and holding my own anxiety to create a space for us to be a group that doesn't know, an experimental experiential group um, not dissimilar to the 1940s in coming together in this format at a time of trauma, complexity, conflict and divides. So I have a love of words and I've deliberately left out words because I'd like us to use our, our thoughts, uh, focusing on what we're feeling whilst looking at the slides and listening to me to, to have some attention paid to your own internal experience of, of as we move through this presentation rather than be sort of spoken at. Um, my relationship with the tabby um, is, is formative, I would say. Um, I think Sarah and Sebastian have often described it as verging on stalking. <laughs> um, I, I knew I wanted to be a part of this group uh, that think, that believe in a mind, not just a brain. Um, and it reminded me of my own adolescence where one of the most formative experiences for me was really being drawn to the absurd and uh, French literature. I studied French and Spanish and, I, and in another life, I think I would have studied um, French and Spanish literature. But I was told by immigrant parents that I needed to get a proper job and this was all fairly hobbyish and could be done in my spare time while studying medicine and getting a proper job. Um, so somewhere along the line I've managed to try and combine the two and I think if we look back to the idea of outsiders and otherness um, I, I was quite moved by the book L'Etranger and um, even the words the double meanings of foreign being strange and the sense of shame that that might bring. Um, and growing up with that sense of um, feeling different, observing slightly from a third position. Uh, as I say, today there's a real anxiety of who, who are we speaking to? Who is this group? Where are we located? Where am I therefore located in relation to you and what's going on for you? <clears throat> And then I'm reminded that this is about the Tavistock and this is about the, the, cen the century. Um, and much of my learning has been experiential learning. And my, my love of my experience at the Tavi has been that it's not been an intellectual pursuit, but one based on intellect and experience and connecting to the feeling um, and coming to my first seminars and sitting in circles, which those of you who've been to the Tavi will know are fairly associated with the Tavi. 
and discussing the meaning and the feeling of the chapters we were reading about Freud papers or Klein or early infant development. And, and obviously I've had the, the pleasure of working with Sebastian in, in liaison. So my associations to the tabby were the first ideas of an idea of mind, not just brain, um, that early experiences play out in groups, be that in, in organizations or in families, that there's always a triangular relationship in mind um, of, an, of an imagined mother, father, child. My experience at the Tabby in, in groups has been that it's about combining art and science and that it should be creative, but with that creativity comes mess and not knowing. And I hope today to, to tolerate my own not knowing as a facilitator. I, it, it, it's complexity, the complexity of the, the world we live in. And this again relates to the, the group relations format. People, you, you might have been to group relations or heard people speak of the spiral, that there's meaning in the configurations of the chair in the room, who you choose to sit next to, what draws you to someone or, or pushes you away from someone else. And, and what does that say about our society as a whole? Um, those of you that know Chris Mawson will know that he sadly passed away prematurely quite recently. And I felt it was important to mention he, he was a great um, st a studier of, of Beyond um, and, and working groups, but also my first analyst. Um, and I feel there's something about, we read these terms from knowing to being, we read about tolerating uncertainty, but to really live that and to offer that in a group discussion took probably about a decade of five times a week psychoanalysis, I think, for me. Being a facilitator is, is, is a complicated thing, particularly in the private sector. I'm, I'm hired and paid for being an expert. So if I was an expert who turned up and said, I don't know, you tell me, um, people might feel duped or shortchanged. Um, so it's a really difficult position to hold and a, and a pretty hard sell commercially to say what I'm going to do is offer a space for us to not know something together. Negative capability is a term that people will have heard um, from Keats. And, and I suppose I added this slide just to sort of say, this is not new thinking. This, these are not new ideas, but to really put them in practice uh, involves angst, uncertainty, tolerating shame, fears of inadequacy. To really lead means to have to recognize and hold some hostile projections. Uh, and that includes one's own. So my own feelings towards the group. Um, so this is Beyond. There's a, a picture of Beyond older. <laughs> um, so there's a sense of being able to listen, but without memory or desire. So that means to really be in the here and now. Um, and particularly now when working in this format on Zoom, how difficult that is. Um, my next analyst was more Winnicott in, in approach um, and I found it incredibly difficult because it was less verbal and uh, a real feeling of space which um, despite having undertaken analysis before I, I did a lot of not turning up <laughs> because I couldn't see the point because there weren't many words because she wasn't doing anything. And yet, uh, you know, with hindsight, you can learn what you have learned and, and it's at an emotional level. So much of group work and group facilitation is very difficult to put into words, but, but you'll know when you've learned something in an experiential way. Um, so this is my current website. Um, and I've put that up there to, to sort of show um, some of the dilemmas. How do you put yourself out there in a space, um, which is a crowded space where there are quick fixes offered, um, where actually to make meaning is, is painful. Um, so I'm, I'm doing that now. <laughs> I think if anything, to, to take away from, from these slides is about thinking in triangles, whatever the approach. So in my work in the NHS, 
um, in family work or in liaison when we ran groups for doctors, nurses, admin, um, it was about thinking about um, the parent, the child and the clinician or the mother, father, child. But this space of an observer being observed. So you're part of the dynamic, but also watching the dynamic. Um, in executive coaching, we think about the person, the role and the organization. What roles do we take up within an organization? In the work meeting that Sebastian was des describing, who are the most vocal? Who are the, who are the quiet voices? Why? Um, one of the, the main links, I think, for, for, for this way of working is the relationship to the first family. Um, I hope people can see that's, that's, that's a dysfunctional family. Um, and, and that we are coloured by our first experiences uh, of family life. Um, and that when interacting in an organisation, we are drawn to certain roles because of our early experiences. And these can detract from organizational function or help or hinder, but the dynamics need unpicking and are difficult to speak to because they're very personal, often very painful and complicated. So I really had to sort of have a conversation with myself and think, well, what do I know and what do I want to say? And, and what I know is, is through now decades of experience that silences are incredibly difficult to hold, but necessary to create this space. Um, that links need to be made to be learned from, that challenges need to be contained, that feelings are an important part of the data of organizational life and need to be felt and fed back. And there is meaning to be made. So we'd like to move on to an experiential section of today and practice what we're preaching um, and think about why did you come here today? So we're a leaderless group. I'd like you to consider and notice what happens between you and within you in the breakout space. What can you learn from the experience of being in this group at this time and in this social cultural context in the hope that we come back together and then there's a, a global picture and that this, this slide is just to sort of remind us that without all the different groups coming together, we're not seeing the whole picture. I hand back to Sarah. Okay, thank you, Lopa. Very thought provoking and maybe a bit anxiety provoking um, for all of us. I'm going to ask us all to break us out into breakout rooms uh, in a second. Um, and we have... Um, Mm, probably about half an hour um, in those breakout rooms, uh, maybe 25 minutes. Um, we'll send you some messages telling you how much longer you've got. Um, and in those breakout rooms, you will find yourselves in leaderless groups. Um, and um, Lopa has sort of suggested what one might notice and, and do in that situation. I think we could put that slide back up again probably so that um sure we can people can keep looking at it um and um and then we'll bring you back together again and we will have some discussion and thinking and talking and trying to make sense of what's happened so because i was going to split you into groups of roughly 10 um so please say yes when you get invited to join a group. And we'll see you again in about 25 minutes. Okay, so welcome back everybody. Um, I'm sure that everybody's had very different experiences in the breakout rooms. Uh, there's also a, a small group of people who didn't go to breakout rooms uh, for reasons that uh, are known to them, but not to us. Um, and 
people and, and a very small number of people who went to breakout rooms and then lost their breakout rooms and then some of them refound them and some of them didn't so there's been a sort of a variety of experiences i would say in the last 25 minutes probably um and um what we want to do really is use the last 15 20 minutes to discuss anything that really you want to discuss i mean you could you could think with us about things that um sebastian and lopez said um and what that made you think about uh, you could think about things that came up in your group. I mean, what we're not going to do is have reporting from the groups because we can't we can't have 24 groups telling us what they talked about because there isn't time and also it wouldn't be a good idea, I think. But do um, either put your hands up um, or put in the chat um, anything that you think about or want to share with the group or want to raise with the group. Um, <laughs> And I will try and gather up things that are written in the chat, but equally you could just, you've got the power to turn your microphones on to unmute yourself. So you can just say something. And maybe Sebastian will reveal to us where he is. <laughs> <laughs> because one of the things that happens when you do something experiential like this is that you don't know what's going to happen and you can't know everything that goes on in all the bits of the jigsaw of the puzzle so one of the things that Lopra and I don't know is why Sebastian chose to go and be in a group when that wasn't what we had planned and what's happened to him in the group but in a way that's part of the group process is that he's done something slightly off piste and um and for anyone that has ever been on a group relations conference or been in an experiential group, I think you'll know that um, people do off piece things and then you have to think about what that means. So perhaps we'll be able to do that. Perhaps Sebastian will tell us what he thinks. I, I, I thought that's what was going to happen to all of us. I had the choice. So I thought, oh, well, that's obviously the plan. <laughs> typical, isn't I it? I knew you would say that. It is typical, though. Yeah, you knew. You knew I would say that. Yeah. I did. So, um, well, let's just have some thoughts. A um, couple of apologies, but why, why don't people speak to what they've been thinking or what they, what's on their mind? Uh, can you hear me? Yes. It's something about finding myself suddenly landing in a group of people that you absolutely know nothing about, have had no experience of. You don't know whether they're going to be friendly or not. You don't know if you're thinking something, whether you're allowed to just say it, and is it going to be listened to? So you're gauging this group of people from their, their smiles or from how they listen or how they look, whether they look interested or not interested, whether they look friendly. And that gives you some permission to say, yes, I've got something to say, and I'm going to take a chance and say it. So I think landing in a group of people that you absolutely didn't know had no connection with before and ended up thinking, yes, I actually like this group because they listened to each other and allowed each other space to say what they wanted to say and were respectful of each other. Hmm. I, I want to say something about we have two people or we thought we had two people with no faces or voices within the group and somebody could be a moderator or, or whatever it was, we don't know, and we still don't know to now. But it made me think about absent voices within the group where even where people know each other, who stay silent during service meetings. And then as soon as the meeting is over, they become very vocal. But during the meeting, mm. they're always silent. And there's a sort of frustration that I always suffer with afterwards, thinking, well, why didn't you say that when you have the opportunity to say that? And this goes on meeting after meeting after meeting. So talking about what Iris was talking about, they're having a voice to say something amongst people you don't know. But there's also something about the absence of voices during people that you do know. And why is that so prevalent within organizations and structures? Mm -hmm. uh, and it feels so deadening. And, um, and I feel sometimes it needs livening up. The group does that sometimes. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I had the feeling um, a bit, what I, well, what's on my mind is something about 
um, this this kind of idea in my head anyway about the about there being an ideal group, a group where everyone's listening carefully and everyone's kind of talking carefully but directly and honestly. And how much of and and then Sarah, you were saying something at the beginning of this session, which I thought was something about the the importance actually and the value of someone going off piste. As some, and I thought that that was kind of somehow that was an alternative idea of, of, of a group. Um, and I don't know if it's an anxiety about whether the how many differences the group, any group can contain, you know, if, if it can, will it bust up if people are not being careful and listening nicely and all, you know, um, it's kind of how, how um, elastic is that container um so that's a bit what my where my thoughts are at the moment but do you think that sometimes it helps if the group starts off being respectful for each other that then allows um people to go off uh, piece. I don't know if it starts like that from the beginning, how that works. Well, I, I was thinking if, if you take an example of a family that perhaps have come into family therapy where they're not respectful, they're not listening, um, but can, you know, I think you can start with that end, I would mm -hmm. think, and you can somehow learn without being taught somewhere in this kind of ongoingness of the group I suppose that you still come back the following week or whatever you somehow learn something um, about the, the thing you talk about about being able to listen and to allow spaces to form between people in the groups that that, that can be tolerated. Um, the other thing that we talked about was the emotional aspect of being part of a group is always absent so nobody in the service meeting again will talk about how does it feel to be sitting here together. What does that feel like? For some people it's more comfortable than it is for others, but it's never discussed. So before you can even start relating, we need to have a think about what is the experience of being actually in the room and where do people position themselves within the room? Where do they sit? Because this is all done deliberately or somebody walks in late and they have to sit in a particular chair because all the other chairs are taken up. And, and this all adds to the sort of complexity of what's going on in that room, but it's never discussed though, in my experience of the emotional experiences within the room. Can I just, um, sorry, I'm not sure I'm using my phone, so I'm not sure if I'm supposed to raise my hand, I can't see a feature, so I have apologies if I'm um, jumping in. Um, so I just wanted to add that I had my camera off initially before um, this started because I'm, I'm doing two things at the same time, working as well as trying to be part of this um, brief uh, seminar or, you know, and just before the breakout rooms, I felt the need to quickly go. I'm a Muslim woman. As you can see, I've got my camera on now, um, but just felt that there's a need for me to, you know, show myself. Um, and I quickly rushed off to quickly put my scarf on and make myself a little presentable. Um, and then I, I just don't know, but I had that need where I needed to, I felt I needed to show myself, to show who I am, my identity is there. Um, and just to represent myself in a way that, you know, I'm, I'm not just a black screen, you know, blank screen. I, I am somebody sitting behind the screen. And I felt, you know, really welcomed by my group, actually. And those people who were as part of my group, you know, I just want to say thank you to you all. It was, it was really nice. I'm really glad, Rahima, that you were able to do that. That's really important. Yeah, thank you. The guy that was talking about um, the emotional impact of being on a group, um, we sat in silence for quite a while and um, I actually felt compelled to break that silence because, and I explained, I think it's because silence meant to me that my mum and dad weren't speaking when I was a child. So I always felt the need to, you know, try and fill those silences. Um, and I also kind of found it quite, a challenge not to, um, 
you know, uh, kind of facilitate a conversation by asking everybody what they did and things. It was actually a real learning experience for me to just sit and watch the conversation emerge, and it did. I found it really interesting uh, what M Mary was saying about um, this ideal group and how, yeah, one of the things that I I have I experience a lot of is is somebody who's very dominating, you know, in a group, and then especially on Zoom, you know, it's really hard to kind of get any of the pauses to reflect or what someone said before interjecting or, or saying something. And really then just feeling that someone's just waiting for me to stop talking and so that they can say something. And, um, and yeah, and it's like, you know, that can help, that can really lead to feelings of alienation or, and, and about, again, about this ideal, like really wanting everybody to be included in, and heard, um, but this sort of isn't the case in, in like, you know, or corporation or, or maybe when people don't necessarily have that sort of level of self-awareness or but yeah it just made me think so thank you i want to come back to the silences because it's so different when you are in a group in vivo and somebody is silent and it was quite different today in the zoom to have somebody who has no face, no voice. So uh, it might feel more uneasy. And at the same time, when in our group, we concentrated on that, we found that technology was the obstacle, which was quite a relief because otherwise it might have felt that uh, there is somebody watching us without us knowing who or what the purpose of it is. So I found that quite interesting today and a different way to relate. Thank you. Yeah, I found the thing on silence interesting because um, I, so like I, I grew up going to kind of various like organizing meetings, political meetings, NUT meetings and things with my mum and, and just kind of playing there while they had their meeting and silence was, a good thing because it was that you'd, you'd get the people who regularly go to these meetings to be silent because then new people would come and if the silence was long enough people would share their ideas and and kind of generally people would want to and the problem was when people who go to those meetings a lot just start talking straight away then then you don't get to hear those views um but then i found it really interesting coming then into medicine where um Kind of the, there is no silence you've got to straight away show that you know the answer and that's showing good leadership and and all these kinds of things um and it's it's then interesting coming to kind of more reflective spaces now like as i'm further on in my career and we're doing more um kind of psychotherapy um but trying to work out then how do you kind of if there if there is are issues that should be discussed and brought up how do you do it and get the engagement of other people. So you're kind of raising your voice, but sometimes it feels like in, definitely through, through a medical background, in raising your voice on certain issues, you're doing something that's unkind or that's that's unfair and that it's, it's kind of impolite to talk about um, kind of social determinants of health and things like that um, regarding patients. And so I, I don't know, I find it interesting now because I see the silence in around those kinds of issues it's so different to the, the good silence that I saw kind of when I was younger. Um, and so it's, yeah, I don't know. It's, I, I think kind of thinking about the title of this, like how do you find your voice without drowning others? I feel that the, the kind of, the others are, are so silent on some of these issues. And it's, I, I don't know how you find your voice without kind of almost, yeah, like dra drowning them in, in silence. My experience in my group was um, that there was quite a lot of empathy and rapport built up in quite a short space of time, um, just from people meeting and sharing ideas and how um, holding that was actually. Um, so, yeah. 
I think for the first few minutes in my group, we were all trying to sort of um, comprehend that we were even taking part in a, a breakout room. It was not something that, you know, certainly I had not expected to, to be put in a, you know, a small room with people I didn't know. I was, um, so yeah, it was really interesting to kind of um, explore, you know, being put into a room rather than if it were to be face to face, you'd sort of walk in and, and choose where to sit and things. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. We were talking a bit when uh, when you'd all gone to the breakout rooms about how we'd done something rather shocking to you by not giving you any warning in advance of the this session that, that there was going to be a sort of random experiential bit and then sending you to breakout rooms. But then we thought, actually, in a way, as you're saying, I think um, that that was part of what maybe was interesting about it was the not knowing. I was going to say that that was a lot of our group time was spent in thinking about the sort of whole ex change of experience from sort of arriving and we talked quite a few of us about the anxiety that provoked and then um, and how we dealt with that anxiety and then there was this sort of relief we all seemed to and I, I guess that experience being the same sort of thing on one level for all of us meant it made us feel quite like a group you know quite together in that way and quite nurturing in a way for those few minutes. Um, I think hearing uh, everyone's perspective and being the experienced group, um, I think I was, uh, I wonder what urges us when we're suddenly get, uh, we're, we're supposed to be in a group uh, and we don't have the choice. What urges us to to keep the group all together and and um, like some others said uh, of ideal group and why do we don't bring the our real emotional uh, um, feelings and the group? So I was wondering what urges us to keep the group all together when we come into it and not disintegrated, um, where there is more something instinctively in us, like um, a baby will try to hold on from uh, its mother. So we all want our dentists to, to, be, to exist and not die in a sense, um, rather than bring immediately a kind of frustration and just break uh, the group. So what are the feelings? Um, I don't know if Bayon or someone else uh, has some uh, insights on that, but yeah, what consists a group? Mm. And why we're we avoiding to disintegrate this group immediately? And what that this means for our identity? Mm. And now there's another ending that we maybe would like to avoid where we have to end this big group. Um, and um, we've just, you know, touched the surface of thinking about what are groups? I thought the last speaker put that very well. Um, and on that note of what are groups, I think we are going to have to end. Sebastian Loper, is there anything you want to say as a last thought? No, thank you very much is all I want to say. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thank, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Well, thank you.